Welcome once again to our digital service here at Apostolic Church. We pray that as you listen to our service online this morning, that you'll be blessed, that you'll hear from God, and that you know that God loves you. Enjoy the service now. God bless. I raise a hallelujah In the presence of my enemies
Good morning, everybody. Morning. The lights are on. Where's it here? Not if anyone's at home, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, lovely to see you all again uh, on this normal September day for Northern Ireland. I have been very blessed to have been away in America for three weeks in the summer, so uh, we got some fantastic weather. And yeah. It's too much actually, not used to it. Like three weeks of just solid sunshine is just, you're sort of looking out going, I wish it was a bit gray. And then you sort of catch, you catch yourself on and go, no, 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 no. But you do, whenever you've been climatized to this, this climate, you, you, you do miss it a wee bit. So um, yeah, but it's lovely to be back again. It's been quite a while, I think July was the last time, but it's been a, it's been a sort of busy, busy and an interesting summer. So I pray that you are all well and um, we're just going to go into God's Word today, and this is, uh, yeah, this is a, something that I've been walking through myself. So this is not just me reading from a book or whatever. But it's interesting. Sometimes God gives you messages, and He lets you walk through things, you know, before He allows you to share. Uh, so it's not just head knowledge; so it's real. And uh, I've been going through a difficult time. Uh, just this year has been quite difficult in so many different ways. And uh, that's a struggle sometimes. That's a struggle. And we're going to look at a psalm. I was encouraged that whenever you get into the psalms, you see that God's people are not exempt from difficulty, and trouble and trial. Um, and just to alleviate the trials you go through, I'm going to put my stopwatch on here. So just in. <laughs> But we're going to look at a psalm that's probably well known to everyone. We know the song, uh, As the Deer Pants for the Streams of Water, Psalm 42. And let's just pray, and then I'm going to read out this psalm, and we're going to just see what the Lord would say to us from it. Father, we thank you this morning that, uh, that you know exactly where each one of us is this morning. We may be sitting in a building, but Lord, you know where we're at in our hearts. You know if we're in the valley you know if we're on the mountaintop, you know if we're in between. Lord, we thank you this morning that you are the Lord and you do not change. We may change, we may be fickle, we may be uh, grumpy, we may be happy, but Lord, you don't change. And we rejoice that, Lord, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We thank you that you are the only real constant in our lives. Lord, and we love you. And we pray that you'll help us. We say, Lord, sometimes, Lord, we know that you just want us to come and say, Daddy, help. And we ask you, Lord, for your help wherever we're at, whatever we're dealing with this morning. We come to our Father and we ask you for your help. We ask you that you give us ears to hear what you would say. And Lord, we pray that you would just meet with us this morning as we look at this psalm in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 42 is uh, a lovely psalm. I'm just going to read it out. I've, I've called this the roller coaster psalm. And I was in America and the first, uh, we were on all these big parks. The first ride that I went on to it was a, the Aerosmith. Now, I didn't, I didn't know it was a roller coaster in the dark. I hate roller coasters. And I was put right at the front. And apparently when I came out, my face was white and I was, <laughs> and I, I really was, I was, I was actually terrified. And then when I, I was thinking about that whenever I was reading this psalm because it's up and down, but we're going to just read it here and then we'll get into it. First one says, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise amid, among the th festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why, so disturbed within me. Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. 
My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my saviour and my God. Now, all of us are familiar with this psalm. We know life is difficult. Life can throw us a curveball in many and varying ways, shapes and forms. We all know this. We've all experienced this. Uh, I don't know. Is there anyone in the room has, who has just stayed on the mountain top the whole duration of their Christian experience? Anyone with their flag? No? no? Nobody here? No? No. Because in between mountains, there's valleys and there's plains. And this psalm in particular is a real window into the journey of faith. We're on a pilgrimage. This is not our home. We're only passing through. And this gives a real insight into what believers walk through in their lives. Through every age, these psalms speak directly to us, to the very core of our being and our experiences. The truth that's contained here is timeless. It doesn't grow weary, or it doesn't lose any of its potency with age because it's God breathed. It's not just been penned from the furnace of this man's affliction. This psalm came from the mind of God, from the word of God. And it shows us that he allows the psalmist to experience these trials. Now, there are theologies that are out there today that are not fully based on the Bible or reality. And we'll try to sell you a spirituality that's free from woes and ills and bad things and, and difficulties. And even more, if bad things are happening to you, it's your fault. You did something wrong. It's you. You have a lack of faith. You didn't pen off into the offering plate. Avoid those like the plague because they do not reflect the full counsel of God. God allows us to go through difficulties. He allows suffering in our life. Now, I, I don't have to admit, and God knows I don't rejoice at that, but it's a reality. It's a part of the journey of faith. And the, the journey of faith and the pilgrimage of faith in today's world is that things don't always go swimmingly. We're not always dancing on the mountain. We're not always living our best life now. We may be in the valley today. We may be in mourning. We may be going through terrible trials. I'm sorry, I don't feel today that I'm in the place of victory. I feel as if I'm trying to get back to the top of the mountain. But God's with me. He's with us in the valley. He's with us on the mountain. And that's the thing. And the psalm seems to depict a serious sense of spiritual depression and isolation and despair. And this is, there's a possibility that this psalm was, was penned during the time of exile. Whenever the, the people of God were away from the land of promise, they were in a foreign land, they languished in Babylon. And this, another psalmist says this, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. How can we sing the song of the Lord in a strange land? The psalmist conveys in the first verses, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? And there's a sense in this psalm that he feels cut off. He feels as if he's been cut off from God, isolated. He's been cut off from that intimate connection with God. And the imagery of a deer panting, thirsty. Uh, this is not a, just a whim or a feeling. This is a deep need. The, the deer, the heart, needs water to survive. Indeed, us, we can't go for more than three days without water or we'll die. Water is essential. And the, the psalmist is using this illustration um, to show that the real and true believer 
Intimacy with God is as important as water. We cannot survive without that sense of God's presence. If you've met with God, if you know God, you'll know that. Religious services, activities, um, all those things do not cut it without the presence of God. We need the presence of God to survive. And the psalm, psalmist is in distress because he feels he's not there. It's been, it's been cut off from him. And this is the cry of this psalmist's heart because ministry, even other people, family, friends, good things, cannot replace intimacy with the Father. It cannot, and the psalmist conveys this very clearly. Not, not church, not friends, not family, not anything. Verse 3 says, my tears have been my food day and night. While people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. The psalmist here is, des is describing the depth of his distress. He's in tears. There's a heartache that will not go away. Tears and sorrow have been his lot. Not rejoicing. Not a declaration of faith. Sorrow, despair and heartache are conveyed. And boy, he's feeling on the one, two, threes of faith that you get in the bookshop. Those would be books of 10 steps to victorious faith. He's not cutting it here. Boy, he's going to need to get a different book. But this, is, this has not just been an internal struggle in his own heart, dealing with his own emotions and his own hurt. I mean, that's bad enough. Whenever the war is raging within, internally, whenever you're in that place and you feel even desolate and just cut off, but it's also happening from without. People on the outside are speaking into his city. Where's your God? Where is he? You know the one you were telling us about a few weeks ago? Where, do you, where is he now? Now, it's very difficult whenever you're dealing with your own internal struggles and your own questions and your own wrestling with God. That is difficult enough. It's difficult whenever you're out in a boat and there's water in the boat and you're trying to bail the water out. But it's even more difficult whenever the storm keeps on putting more in. That's hard. That's hard to manage. And this is what this psalmist is going through. The trial here, I believe, is relentless. It's coming at him from every side, every angle. There's no rest. There's no sign of God. There's no sign of respite. And I think of Paul's words in the, the story in Acts 27, whenever he was journeying to Malta and the storm came. There's a verse in it that it shows that the depth of, and the Lord used this to speak to me in America way 20 odd years ago when I was working there. Verse 20 says of Acts chapter 27 says, When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. That's where Paul was, the great apostle. That was where he arrived at. And that's where we can arrive at in our faith. Whenever there's no outward sign of God doing anything, whenever you feel cut off, whenever you feel as if everything's raging around you, the storm, that's hard. But I um, can't go into Acts 27, but Paul doesn't stay there and he has an encounter with God and God delivers him. It's a difficult place to be and no sign of deliverance, no hope. And even those outside don't see any hope as well. That's even harder whenever they're giving up on you. <clears throat> but there's another pain in these verses that I believe is even more painful for the psalmist. And he says in verse 4, These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. I believe that this was an even more difficult pain to bear than whatever trials he was going through. And even what people were saying. Because he remembered better days. He remembered when he went to the house of God and he rejoiced. He remembered going in, celebrating, bringing his sacrifice with his friends. He remembered those lovely days of God's presence, promises fulfilled, blessings evident, God close, friends near, all those things. But now he feels that he's cut off from God. 
and cut off from that. He feels cut off from those times. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in that place? Then the enemy comes along with his accusing voice. God doesn't care. God doesn't care about you. God doesn't love you. Where's God? I believe that at some point in our lives, if you've not been there, there may be a point that you'll come there. You can come to that place of temptation. And it is temptation because we're tempted to doubt God's love. We're tempted to doubt that God knows where we are. We're tempted to doubt that God knows exactly what way we see, we feel. We're, we doubt that God remembers us. And that's the very point where we are tested. And we may fail for a time. We may languish in doubt and self-pity. And instead of a time of intercession, we can have a good old time of an intercession and we can wallow in our self-pity. And I'll tell you what, I've been there this week, so I have. And that's not good to do, but I'll tell you what, it's, it's bad if you stay there. The psalmist is there, but he doesn't stay there. You see, if we've known God's closeness and God's blessing, I believe it makes it all that harder. Think about Joseph. And this has been a very, very real uh, just point in the life of Joseph, a man who went through severe trials, the depth of which we're given an insight to. I don't know if you you know this, and I've probably mentioned it several times. It's very important scripture to me. Psalm 105 and verses 17 to 21. It says, he sent a man before them, that's God, sent Joseph, who was sold for a slave. They humbled his feet in fetters. The iron pierced his soul. Another translation say, iron entered into his soul. Until his word came, the word of the Lord inflamed him or tested him. The king sent and he released him, the ruler of the people, and set him at liberty. Now, we all know the story of Joseph. We know the outcome, you know, but do you know that Joseph didn't have a Bible and he wasn't reading his story? I guess this is what happens to me in the end. He was living it. He was walking through it. So it is with all of us. We're walking through our own journey, our own walk with God. We don't have the end. We have the end of the book of Revelation. We know that in the end we win. But I'll tell you what, it's in the middle that it's difficult. It's when you're walking through the trials. That's difficult. And the people of God need to go to God's word to find encouragement. And we know what happened to Joseph. God didn't leave him. God didn't forget him. God elevated him. And he allowed him to go through these trials and difficulties. And we don't have time to unpack that, but there's very definite reasons why God did that, to prepare him for what God had for him. And that's a whole different story. The trials of being rejected and, and despised were family by family is what Joseph suffered he was sold as a slave into a foreign land. He was lied about when he tried to do the right thing. Have you ever been lied about whenever you've tried to do what is right? It's hard. It's difficult. And you want to you wanna take a course of action. But the Spirit of God thankfully presses in on us and tells us to calm down, calm the jets, just relax. But I'm sure he was incensed. God, I've tried to do the right thing. And I've been given... The complete opposite. And these things must have been difficult. Those very trials, I've been rejected by my family. I've been thrown into a pit. I've been uh, sold as a slave. I mean, he was a victim of human trafficking, basically. Uh, I watched a film recently there, The Sound of Freedom, which was about human trafficking. That's going on today. Joseph was a victim of this. Sold as a slave into a foreign land. Now, the, the depths of his trials were fierce. I don't know if I could go through that. But God knows what we can bear. But you know what I think was the hardest thing for Joseph? It was the fact that God had spoken to him and prom given him dreams of greatness. You're going to be ruling over your family. You're going to be... And these were in Joseph's minds. And I don't know about you, but I find that difficult, difficulty is not necessarily the hard things that we go through because that is common to all mankind. All of us face difficult things. You don't like it, but I'll tell you what's harder whenever God's spoken to you and it seems to be 
a million miles away from. In fact, you feel as if you're in the opposite place of what God has said. Now, that's hard. And that's why it says the word of the Lord tested him. God's word tested him. And it was a severe test. And it went right to the depth of his being. But I'll tell you what it does. And I'll tell you what the trials of life do when we walk through them. And we maintain even a glimmer of hope and faith. It puts a steel into your heart and into your experience. That you can convey to people in the world who need to hear it. Friends and family. People you'll minister to. And the very iron chains that went into his soul. Enabled Joseph to bear golden chains of office. That he could rule over a nation with justice and integrity. That he knew what it was to feel treated and downtrodden. He knew what it was to suffer injustice and he was able then to rule a nation and the world that came to Egypt's doors with justice and fairness, integrity because he knew what it was to suffer injustice. And it put a steel into his heart and into his life and his experience. And your trials today are not in vain. They're being sent for a purpose. God would not let you walk through them unless he knew Unless he was trying to accomplish something in you. So be encouraged today. Let the trial not be the sole focus. We need to, to use everything within us to, to lift our gaze from the trial and onto our Heavenly Father. The psalmist then goes on uh, to say, in verse 5, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? And the human soul has the ability to go from the raptures of joy and ecstasy to plumb the very depth of despair. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote a book on spiritual depression uh, because it's a reality. There's a reality in this that's conveyed in the Psalms of uh, of a place where the believer can walk, walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Not even death, the shadow. Because we live in a fallen world and death's shadow is cast the whole way over it. And we walk through that. And we can walk through many dark valleys. We can walk through many ravines. And the Psalms depict this so clearly through so many people. And this psalmist is downcast. He's been brought low by the trials and difficulties faced. He's weary. He's tired. He's disillusioned. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been weary? Even in your faith, have you ever been tired and disillusioned? Well, the psalmist was there. Paul was there. The prophets were there. But they didn't stay there. And God won't keep you there. And there's theologies today that say you should never be sad. You should never be downcast. Just put on a brave face. Well, I think that's sometimes denial. Because God can handle it whenever we come to him with our cries. The psalmist here is praying, God, where are you? You know, God's not going, you're not speaking to me in faith. God knows where he's at. The goal is to get him from that place of despair to a place of faith. And sometimes you have to walk it out. You've got to walk to get there. And this is what the psalmist is doing. He's pouring out his heart. And you know something? God can handle it. God's got very big. He's nothing surprises God. God knows what's in our hearts. He knows. But you'll read in the Psalms that the psalmist don't stay there. They get to a place where they're hoping in God again, which we're going to see. The depression and despair have been bad enough, but why, God, why? And this is a question I think we ask. I know that I ask, why are you letting this happen to me, God? Because we don't understand maybe the full purpose of what God's trying to accomplish. And it brings an added despair and pain and perplexity. Why, God, are you letting this happen? Well, you know something? There's someone else who knew what it was to suffer grief and sorrow Psalm 53 tells us the suffering servant, he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And the one who walks with us has walked there. He's walked through the valley. He's walked through the very caverns of Sheol and he's now ascended on high. He didn't stay there. He rose. Psalm 22, we see what Christ echoed on the cross my God, my God, why have you 
forsaken me. So he knows what it is to feel that. He knows what it is. But we're going to see here in Psalm uh, 42 verse 5, we see the first glimmer of light. The psalmist says this, and this is why I'm saying it's a roller coaster psalm, because it's like his head is down and he lifts his head up. And he says, put your hope in God. For I will yet praise him. I'm maybe not doing it right now. I'm maybe not there right now. I'm maybe not able to. But I'm starting to rise. I'm starting to lift up my eyes. And that's where it begins. Whenever we lift up our eyes off our circumstances, off the bad things are happening, and we realize that there's a place we can lift our eyes to and we can look to him who sits enthroned in heaven, who knows our lot, and hope begins again, the first glimmer of light. And then he goes back again. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of Jordan, from the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. You know, whenever I was on that roller coaster in America, I was coming to the nice wee flat bit and my hope started to lift again. And then I feel as if my soul was downcast along with my whole body as we went right down and it was in the dark as well which was was more but I always think I'm going to think about that that roller coaster ride when I read this psalm because he's gone up and down and sometimes that can be us we can be in good form and then we can be back down again and it can be a real roller coaster but God can handle that the tenor of the psalm is now turned and he begins to regain his footing and directs his hope which he still has back to God again. He knows that deep down, that through all this pain, that God is the only hope. There is no other hope. Why is this happening? I may never know. But the only hope of deliverance is found in God. And hope is as essential for the spiritual life as water is for the, spirit, as for, for the physical life. And hope is the last branch we can grasp at before we sink. Sometimes hope and hoping in God is the last thing we'll do. We'll do everything else. We'll try everything else. We'll say, yeah, my friends will help me. The, the pastor will help me. The church will help me. Ministry will. When God's saying, I want you to look to me. Yeah. And sometimes I wonder if our trials are specifically designed. And there's a real theme in trials in the scripture that God's trying to get his people to turn their eyes to him. And not to rely and look on anything else. Verse 7 says, Deep calls to deep. In the roar of your waterfalls, all your waves and breakers have swept over me. Again, he reverts uh, to himself and his experience and his woes. And he said, again, he's on this roller coaster. And we see the depth of a soul. A soul can reach, like I said, the heights of ecstasy, but it can also plumb the depths of despair. He's saying what he's going through is not a shallow thing. From the very depth of my being, he cries out to God. And you know something? He's likening the difficulties he's facing in his life, like the waves and breakers of the sea. Now, uh, I don't know about you. I don't know if anyone goes into the sea swimming. No, well, in my... I don't know it's my insanity or something. I started doing it recently there and it's amazing. It really is wonderful. And we go in in the West Strand in Port Rush. Believe it or not, it is actually warm. It really is, yeah, especially this time of year. But one of the things uh, that really spoke to me when, whenever we were uh, on the beach one day and there was a lot of waves coming in on the West Strand and it can get very, very wet. And we were... Uh, uh, going in and I was going we're not going to be able to swim very far because it's just so we went in and we literally just stood. all we could do was stand there and you were getting hit by waves and I thought about this psalm all of my your waves and breakers and that's what trials are like they can break over your life and it's hard sometimes to stand in fact we were being carried off our feet so we were and it was very interesting because all you did was try to regain your footing and stand waiting for the next one to come upon you. But there was something that happened and this is what can happen in trials and we need to be so careful and we need to really seek the Lord because what we noticed was we were at one position on the beach and the waves were coming in and we were just spending all our time dealing with the waves. The next one we looked and we realized that our bags were away up there. We'd been carried away 
from the position that we'd begun in. But that's what trials can do. They can, they can take us away from that sure footing and that place of hope and trust in God. And I thought it was a, a, a great illustration because it's relentless. We weren't getting a breath. We felt overwhelmed. And that's the illustration the psalmist is using. The things that are coming against me are knocking me for six. And that's what difficulties, and it's not letting, letting up. And this is, a, this is difficult for the psalm, psalmist um, because these things, if we hadn't have been as good swimmers, we could have actually drowned. Some, one of the days particularly, uh, we had to literally get out. And we have to be so careful. We need to, 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 to regain our footing and look up. And the only thing we could do was go for the shore. And I think in times of trial and difficulty, we have to reach the shore. We need to, we need to find that refuge and that solid ground again in God where waves may come, but our footing is sure. And the psalmist says in verse eight, by day the Lord directs his love at night. His song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? And it finishes with, why my soul are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my saviour and my God. The one thing that I noticed here in finishing was the attack of the enemy wasn't just directed at the psalmist, and his faith, it's also directed at God, because that's what the enemy does. Has God said, did God really mean that he loves you? Did God really mean that you're his child? And that can be sore. That's very, that's very personal, because life can be very difficult to us. And you could be this morning in a place like that, where you have been pounded by the trials of life, or... You could meet someone who's there, okay? Don't be a Job's comforter. Don't try to explain things or give a theological answer to all the problems. Don't even point to the good things because the trial a person's going through is usually on a deeper level than the common graces that we enjoy. Stop and listen. Walk with them. Put your arm around them. Mourn with those who mourn. Weep with those who weep. Don't try to fix it. But be a support to them because that's what people in these places really need. And God wants us as individuals, most of all, to turn to him for help. Not even to look to friends. Great when friends and support are there. But ultimately, our Father wants us to run into his presence and say, Dad, I, I need help. Not a great theology, oh, almighty God of the omniscient. That's wonderful. I love praying like that. But I'll tell you something. There's times I think God just wants us to come and say, Dad, I need your help. I need you, Lord. I need you. And this psalmist needs God. He wants God. And the pain in his heart is not just the trials. It's a sense of being cut off from God. But at the end of this psalm, he surrenders again in hope. Because we do have to surrender. And he puts his trust once more in God again. He forsakes the ravages. And they are ravages of unbelief and fear and anxiety. And he sets his hope once more in the God of his salvation. You see, the fiery trials of life have a result that we need to remember because the Bible tells us that he sits as a refiner of gold. And the Apostle Peter tells us that your faith is more precious than gold. And God will refine that faith through the trials that you will walk through in this life. But they don't go on for he knows exactly when to turn the heat up and when to turn it down. And he knows exactly what he's trying to get and sometimes it can get ugly because sometimes when the fire's up, all this stuff comes up, all this rubbish. And the thing is, you can push it down again. Sometimes you need to get it out and let the Lord just skim it off as he purifies your faith. So to conclude, I want to encourage you this morning. 
if you're going through a trial, if you're going through a difficulty, read the Psalms, read Psalm 42, read Psalm 43, because you're not alone. You've never been alone. You have brothers and sisters here who are going through things, have gone through things. Some of us might be on the mountain. Some of us may be in the valley. But we all need each other. We need to encourage each other to put our hope in God alone this morning. Let's just pray. And if you need someone this morning to pray with you, to draw alongside, please don't be shy. Ask someone, because that's why we're here. We meet in God's house. Ask someone to pray with you, to speak to you, and just to be there as well. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you this morning that you are the God of our salvation. And Lord, everything may not go uh, according to the latest book we've read from the bookshop. Father, the journey of faith. Your word says, oh, the ways of God are past finding out. Who has been your counselor? Lord, we come before you this morning and we submit to you. We submit, as Peter says, under the mighty hand of God, that you may lift us up in due time. Lord, we need you this morning and we pray that you'll help us. We pray for your grace. I pray for anyone who's walking through the valley this morning that you will just draw alongside and help them to hear the shepherd's crook on the wall of the valley. Let them know your presence, Father, I pray, as we commit our time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so
Christmas time.